Okay. Now I have to get this ready though. Okay, good morning, everyone. Sorry for the long delay and all the technical difficulties. It's too bad we didn't have one of those things that they have on television. You just put a fake screen on there. We'll be back in a minute. <laughs> Anyways, okay. So um, this morning, we're going to, come on now, don't argue with me. Okay, thank you. Uh, this morning's message is uh, we're in the long, hot summer, okay? Uh, and I know that people have been kind of confused about what this all means. They kind of get lost in this whole translation. So we're going to kind of go over this a little bit, just a little bit. But the title is The Three Stages of the Fall of Israel and Their Last Gasp, okay? Now, this is going to take a couple sermons to get through all this. But uh, we have been inside the holy place sanctuary. Where is the holy place sanctuary at? Go on, simple question. It's in heaven, right? So we've been studying what Jesus has been doing in heaven, correct? And so just like we did in during the time of the spring feast, at the time of at the feast of Pentecost, when, um, when Jesus ascended to heaven, we took a look at what was happening in heaven and unpacked everything that was taking place when Jesus showed up. For the coronation ceremony of the high priest, remember the parade, the, the, the escapade of the war hero that came home. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Why did Jesus come home? <laughs> Why did Jesus come home to heaven? He did what? He finished the earthly ministry. What was the earthly ministry? His life, death, resurrection, yes. Okay, right? Correct? So he did what? He conquered Sin, death, right? So isn't that like one of the greatest things that you would have a parade for if you were in heaven? Hello? So not only that, but he finished his earthly ministry and went to heaven to what? To begin his heavenly ministry, right? So Revelation 4 and 5 unpacked this whole event, right? So we looked at that. We took a look at that. We examined what was happening in heaven. Then we took a look at what was happening on earth. While this was all happening, because we discussed the spiritual gifts, what was happening on the Feast of Pentecost, the things that were happening with the people. Okay, so we took a look at what was up in heaven. And then at the same time, what was happening in heaven, we took a look at what the people were doing while that was happening in heaven. So now we're doing the same thing. We took a look at what Jesus was doing in heaven during this period called the long, hot summer. Because after the spring comes what? No. After the spring comes what? What are we in right now? Is it fall? I wish it was fall. <laughs> it is some, <laughs> comes a summertime. Right, right, right. And so if you're a Hebrew, you would know after the Feast of Pentecost that there's not going to be any more what? Feast. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. And you're right, you're right, Mary, that there won't be any more water. That's true. Not that there won't be any more water, but water starts to dry up, right? Because it's a long, hot summer. The feasts are over. The harvests are done. Now it's time to, you know, it's, it's ugly. I don't like summer. I really don't. But anyway, so I'm using my own opinions here. But, you know, there's the, the water starts getting scarce. Food starts getting scarce. This is during a time of the ancient Palestine era. And so it's not like nowadays where there's refrigeration. Or, I mean, it, it was, you know, people really had hard times during the summer. Okay. Now you'd look at this spiritually. Okay. Right. I know. But the, even with the gardens, I mean, when your water is drying up, you know, it's really hard. Food started getting scarce. So now if you take these, these practical aspects and you apply them spiritually and you look at this Hebrew calendar where it is and you have it here on your handout. Okay. Now let's take a look at this because I want to just slightly unpack this. So we have good bearings of how this is unfolding in the timeline between God and his people in the history. Okay. Beginning with the time when Jesus was born all the way to the very end of the new heaven and all the way to the new heaven and new earth. Okay. That's the timeline we're going to look at right here just for a second. Now on your handout, you have a square, right? There's a square. The first shape that you notice is it's a square. Okay. 
And then in that square, it's divided into four parts, right? Because on the very top left hand is winter, okay? And how I know that is because in the black circle there is the names of all the months that we attribute to, right? January, February, March, on, so and so on, and so on. So the left-hand square there is winter. The right-hand top square, obviously, would be spring. The bottom square on the right hand is summer. The left bottom is fall or autumn. You see that? Okay. And then in the very outside circle is the name of all the Hebrew months, 12 of them, right? And where do they start? Where does number one start? In, in the month of Nisan. Now you look at where it is in relative to our calendar, it's in the middle of March. Sometimes it's at the end of March, beginning of April, okay? that begin And they began their calendar at the Feast of Passover. So the Passover, the unleavened bread, Feast of First Fruits, and the Pentecost all happened during the spring. You understand that? Now, when the spring ended... Be and then what naturally occurs after spring is the summer, okay? So now looking at this spiritually, looking at this in a spiritual timeline, Jesus Christ fulfilled all the spring feasts that they've been doing over and over and over again for thousands of years that all these sacrifices and ordinances were pointing to the Messiah that would come he came and fulfilled all those in the year 31 AD. So you can literally say spring feast fulfilled. You see that there? It says spring feast fulfilled, 31 AD. All the spring feasts were fulfilled by Jesus in 31 AD, okay? So after Pentecost begins the long, hot summer. So after 31 AD, it would logically be able to say then, well, then the long, hot summer spiritually must have started if it's a timeline in the year about 31 AD. Now, some people say it's 31 AD. Some say it's 34 AD, and we'll get into the reason why of that. And some say it was 36 AD. And the reason why they reference that is because of Acts chapter 11, uh, verse, uh, I want to say 17, where they say, well, it's at the end. Uh, where uh, they say that uh, Barnabas goes to Antioch, talks to the people there in the way, and spent over a year ministering to them, and they became what was known as the very first Christians. And that's, if you want to know where the root word, what, why are you a Christian, you can just go back to Acts chapter 11 and say, the Bible says what is a Christian. And so, therefore, whatever the Bible says is the reason why I'm a Christian, and the word comes from the Bible before anything else, okay? So, either 31, 34, 36, it doesn't matter. One of those time, one of those dates starts this thing called the long, hot summer. So, now, the summertime, there's no feast, right? Spiritual food is gone, or it's, it's diminishing, Okay, and water is diminishing. Okay, so that means that there must have been a time period, which we looked back at last time, where Jesus was in the holy place during the hot summer. And that means that while Jesus was there in the holy place, there must have been some starving and famines and things spiritually were happening on earth. While he was keeping the lamp lit, remember the seven branch candlestick, while he was keeping the table of showbread full of bread, fresh bread, while he was intercessory, inter interceding with our prayers through this time of the long, hot summer until when? Because everybody was waiting for what was going to come, what season comes after summer? Autumn. And so, what is the first? feast that begins the announcement that says that summer is over the feast of trumpets so between let's say 34 a.d that's where i put my marker at 34 and i'll tell you why 34 a.d until a certain time in history 
was a long, hot summer. Well, so when did the trumpets begin? And Mary, what did you say? 1798 is when things in the world started changing because the Bible before 1798 was restricted. People would be burnt at the stake. You have to put this in your mind spiritually that there was a famine in the land spiritually, and it went from starting in 34 AD, okay, and started becoming diminishing. Now, you, if you look at the seven churches, you read the first church, there is a lot of things that are happening, but you read Revelation chapter 12, and it says there, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and her seed and went to make war with the woman, and the woman fled into the wilderness for 1,260 days. So you can tell that through history, now it didn't have like an, an impressive uh, oppression going on in 34 AD. In fact, the church was exploding. But what was the dragon doing? He was enraged because he could not get that child of the woman because the child was caught up to the throne of God and sat next to God because that child of the woman was Jesus Christ who died and now was resurrected, went back home, and the devil could not get him anymore. So if you can't get the, the mother, who do you go after? The children, the church. So this is why the long, hot summer begins after the Feast of Pentecost. And so the summer lasts from 34 AD, I say 34 AD, till 1798. After 1798, the, one of the, a dragon that had seven heads and seven horns representing an agent of the big red dragon, which is the devil, and the seven horned, seven headed dragon is an agent, of, which is Rome, that represented and did for the big red devil dragon, his work for him did his work. One, one, one of his heads was wounded to death, which means that something happened. What happened in 1798? Well, Napoleon Bonaparte, through the General Berthier, went was in, in campaign over in Italy and uh, surrounded the Vatican, took the Pope and put him in prison. We all as Adventists should know this. And then there was the end of the, the divine monarchy being chosen as the one by the Holy Roman Empire, who is going to be kings and queens. All that ended in democracy, I put that in quotes, began. And so then an awakening started happening. It's called the first awakening, the first great awakening to where Bible society, biblical societies, people in all over the world began to unpack the Bible and start bringing in the Bible into people's homes again. And it had more freedom, which means the water began to flow again. The famine started disappearing. People were able to spiritually eat the bread of life again without so much oppression. Do you understand? So that ended. And so summertime goes from 34 AD till 1798. Then, and I have it right here, Feast Falls begins in 1798. Long, hot summer began in 36 AD, 34 AD, somewhere around there. And so after the Feast of Trumpets begins the Day of Atonement. Now, I didn't enter that in here, but the Day of Atonement is part of the Feast of Trumpets, correct? Is that right? Yes. And so the Feast of Trumpets was an announcement of the Day of Atonement. Do you understand? So in 1798 was like an announcement preparing the people for something that was about to occur later on a couple of years later, which actually began in 1840. And then by 1843, it is known as the, the, the anti-typical Day of Atonement begins. And this is where people realize when you find in Revelation chapter 14, it says, fear God and give glory to him for the day of his judgment. The hour of his judgment has come. It is here. This is when people realize that's the announcement 
of the Day of Atonement. And that began in 1843. And you know what? The Day of Atonement is still ongoing right now, which means we are in right now the anti-typical Day of Atonement. Do you see how this calendar is a timeline? Yeah, you see how the feasts are a timeline that God had put for us to understand the great plan of salvation until he comes and beyond. Because guess what? After the feast of, of or the day of atonement, there begins the feast of tabernacles. When does the feast of tabernacles begin? We do not know. We don't know. It hasn't happened yet. You know what happens though? It begins when Jesus comes. So whenever Jesus shows up, that's when the Feast of Tabernacle begins. Now, your task is to be to go look at these feasts in Leviticus and try to compare the spiritual connections of the end times and the days that we're living in right now and understand how these things are meant for you personally. Do you understand the Hebrew calendar a little bit better now? This is why we're in the day of the long, hot summer. Because we just finished the Feast of Pentecost. We just finished all the spring feasts. Now we're going into that long, hot summer. So between 34 AD and 1798, we're looking at all that history. Now we went up, we went up to heaven through the Bible and ex examined what Jesus was doing during the long, hot summer. Now we're going to go back down and we're going to go examine the people, what was happening while Jesus was in heaven during the long hot summer. Now remember, Jesus was in the long was in the holy place ministry more than any other time in Christian history. So that means this long hot summer is a very long time. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus was in the holy place for more than any other time in in the sanctuary. He was more there in in the holy place than in the courtyard. He's been in there he was in there longer than he is in the most holy place. Most of the Christian era, Jesus is in the holy place, which means that the long, hot summer is the longest part of the Christian era. Does that make sense? There's a lot of bloodshed that has happened from 34 AD to 1798. And we ain't seen nothing yet. All right. Okay. So now what we're going to begin with is I'm going to, give you the scripture reading for this morning, which is in Daniel chapter, or I mean, Matthew chapter 24. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, starting, it says, therefore, when you see the abominations of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, mm, whoever reads this, let him understand. So Matthew inserts this, whoever reads this, let him understand. Do you think we're not supposed to understand this? If Matthew says that Jesus wants us to understand this, do we need to understand this? What do we need to understand? What do we need to understand? When you're reading that, what are we supposed to understand? Say that aloud, Mary. Get the microphone. It's right by Richard there. What is it? Uh, the abomination of desolation. Yes. The abomination. Does anybody understand what that means? You know, it took me years to like actually unpack that. Finally, I just sat down and said, ah, I'm going to iron this out until I get it straight in my head what this means. Because I didn't understand what it meant for a long time. But boy, when I got it, I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. So. Let him who reads, let him understand the abominations of desolations. Then let the then. So now here we go. So after you understand that, then Jesus says, then let those who are in Judea flee into the mountains. So he's telling the audience, you need to go back and read Daniel. Because that's all about you guys. He's saying to these people, to his people. Okay. It also reflects to us because we are his people. Do you understand? So he says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetops go down to and take any and go down, not go down to and let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. What days? What days? It's a twofold thing. It's what's that? Days 
of the abomination of desolation. Right. Peter says the day that Jerusalem surrounded was surrounded. And and uh, Richard said the you know abomination of desolations. That's exactly right. That's both of those. So woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. Now, let me ask you something. Now, is this during the long, hot summer? Jesus is foretelling something here. Is this during the long, hot summer? Yes. Uh, if it is 34 AD in 1798, where does 70 land? It's during the long, hot summer. Okay. So, well, to the, because the reason why I say 70 is because Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, if people didn't know that. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight might not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. And you know, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. When people heard this in 66 AD, Cestius came in. Yes, Cestius came in and was sick and tired of the Jews in 66 AD. He said, we're done with these guys. We're going to end it. And he goes and marches in with a formidable army, and they surround, and they put up these, these standards around the city. And they were, you know what they were? They were eagles. And they, look, and they have little artifacts and relics of them still to this day that they found back in old times and back in the first century. And they looked, they looked, Eerily like the United States American flag, the eagle. Exactly the same eagle. And they set up these standards with this Ameri or not Ameri but with this Roman eagle and a sunburst. It's signifying the worship of Mithra. And when they and when the Christians, not the Jews, when the Christians saw this, we'll get into this later when we get to this timeline of 70 AD. When the Christians that were following Jesus remembered what he said here in Matthew 24, when they were standing there and then they went back and they, they went back in their minds and remembered this, what do you think they did? They they heeded the Lord's words. And what do you think they did? They fled. They fled to Pella. But what the interesting thing was is they didn't leave because they were surrounded. The crazy thing is, and it's not by accident, is that when uh, when Cestius came to attack the city, the next morning he wakes up and he just packs up and leaves. Nobody to this day can understand. I know why, but nobody to this day, no historian can understand why. That there was no reason for him to pack up his army and left. And the Jews chased him and his army and slaughtered a lot of the Jews in the back flank. They flanked them and then and slaughtered some of them. And then the Jews come back to Jerusalem going, see, we could take these guys out. There is nothing to worry about. And then Titus came. Oh, did I say Jews? Yes, yes. The, the Jews... The Jews chased the Romans and slaughtered some of the Romans in the back of the army while they were fleeing, while the Romans were fleeing. So, um, and so in 70 AD, now whatever happened to Cessius, he retired and got in trouble. And I mean, Rome was really upset with him. But the next General Titus, I don't know why, I got to get through this, but General Titus in 70 AD came and set up his standard and and by this time, though, when those guys fled in 66 AD, all the Christians fled to Pella. This is a little place that's carved out inside a mountain. It's a beautiful place. Still can go there today. But all the, all the Jews were sitting comfortably thinking that they just beated those ridiculous Romans and they had nothing to worry about. And when Titus came... He destroyed them and the temple, and it was never to be built again, ever, ever. I don't care what anybody says to this day that they're trying to build a third temple. That's not the temple, straight up. You cannot build what Jesus said you're not going to build. So today, we are going to begin the study on what the people were doing, doing during the long, hot summer while Jesus was ministering as high priest in the heavenly sanctuary above. We have to begin at the roots, though, to lay out the foundation to understand what made this time in history, the long, hot summer, so important. Okay, In Bible prophecy, 
God's Israel in Bible prophecy, God's Israel is to be understood symbolically and universally today. In other words, God's Israel is no longer in the Middle East. God's true Israel is worldwide. God has only one people in all ages. And you know what that is? It's those who receive Christ as Savior and Lord. However, there is two stages to this. The Old Testament saints who accepted Christ, who was promised, whereas those of us who live and lived during the New Testament times and beyond the period of Christ's history, accept Christ who has fulfilled the promise. Do you understand what I'm saying? The Old Testament and what Mary was just telling, showing us in the Hebrews, they did not see Jesus, but they trusted the Lord, even though they did not see him. And they died not seeing him, but they trusted him. Now, when Jesus comes as, as our Savior and Lord, and beyond, when he died, resurrected, ascended back to heaven, and beyond, so all the people that didn't see him die, resurrect, and ascend to heaven centuries later, even during the time when he, they, even the time just after he had ascended and may, maybe never had seen him before, they are the new, te they are still who believe in him, accept him, are the true Israel. All right? But Jesus is still the center of both periods, Old and New Testament. When God chose Abraham, it was with the purpose of bringing the blessing to all nations of the earth. And you find that in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. It was God's purpose to bless all the nations, not just one. In order to fulfill his plan, God chose 12 men who became the founders of national Israel. Those men then multiplied into 12 tribes that became the nation of Israel. God placed Israel at a strategic center of three great countries, which is Europe, Asia, and Africa, so that passers through would learn the gospel and go back to their nation with the light that they had just received. The gospel was preached in that time in literal types and ceremonies that pointed to every aspect of the saving work of the Messiah. What do you think those literal types and ceremonies were? The spring feasts. Do you understand? But Israel failed in its mission. Before the Babylonian captivity of 605 BC, they embraced the pagan practices of the surrounding nations. And after the captivity of 536 BC, they isolated themselves from the nations. So they basically went from a leftist kind of mentality to a right wing kind of mentality. Interesting. When Israel failed to get to a great degree on its, in its mission, Jesus came anyway and spiritually fulfilled the literal types and ceremonies, which you see in the diagram that he filled all the spring feasts in 31 AD. He retraced in himself the history of Israel by fulfilling the spring feasts and redeemed the people. And in doing so, he redeemed Israel. All right. Jesus then chose 12 Jewish men as the founders of the Christian church and sent them out to go preach the good news about the Messiah who had come. By their preaching, the 12 multiplied into a great nation. And the mission of that nation was to reach the entire world with the message of Jesus in order to prepare the world for his second coming. So God's plan for Old Testament Israel and his plan for the church in the apostolic times during the long, hot summer and beyond are the very same plan. It is to teach and preach the gospel so that the world can be saved. There is only one Israel throughout the entire period of history between God and his people. And it always had one savior, Jesus Christ. All right. 
We have to retrace the history a little bit to understand the role Israel had in the first coming of Jesus and what resulted in Israel losing their covenant relationship with God that resulted in the desolation of the nation of Israel. This sheds light upon the fierce battle between Christ and Satan during the time of the summer, of which during this time of Christian history was the most bloodiest there ever has ever been to God's people to date. All right. You're talking billions slaughtered in the name of Jesus. So there's three stages of Israel's history. Okay. I broke it up into three stages. We have to begin at Mount Sinai because it's at Mount Sinai where God contracted a covenant with Israel. This is where the covenant officially begins with Israel. Now, God announced to Abraham that he was going to make a covenant. The covenant on Mount Sinai, though, was ratified. So this is where we have to begin the first stage. All right. And you find this in Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 6, where God made a covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai. And it says there on the third month, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt on the same day, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim, had come into the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God and the Lord called him from the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, so is he saying, is he making a covenant here with the people? Yes, through Moses. You have seen what I had did in, to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. So God's goodness should motivate them, shouldn't it? Yes. And he's saying, I took away the bondage of the Pharaoh, and now I'm going to make you mine. But Israel has to agree, Right. So what does verse 5 say? Now, therefore, if, if, is that a conditional statement? It sure is. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nations. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel, God says to Moses. What God is saying, I want to marry you, Israel. This is a marriage covenant. All right. How, so how is Israel going to respond to the call of God? How are they going to do it? Well, in Exodus 19, verse 7 and 8, it says here, Israel, Israel responds by promising to obey God's voice. All right. So it says, so Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all the words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Now, is there a covenant between, because he, see, God says, I take this as my bride. And then he says, Israel, what do you say? And they say, I do. And it says, so the marriage covenant is, has begun. You're married to me. You are my bride, right? So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. So he brings it back to the Lord and says, they said, I do. Is that not a marriage covenant or not? So this was the marriage covenant made by God and the Israelite people. Then after this, God gave his moral laws. And after this, God gave the ceremonial systems of laws and morals to teach to people the great plan of salvation. And then the tabernacle was built after this and sanctified. And we find this momentum event in Exodus chapter 40, verses 34. Now, this is so important because you're going to see, pay attention to the words here of what God has, has planned for his people and how he reacts to this, okay? The Shekinah, this is where you know that God starts to dwell with his people. The Shekinah enters the temple of the wilderness and God dwells with Israel, okay? This is how we know that the covenant is being ratified. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, okay? So what is that? This is a symbol 
that God pre presence that God's presence was was with His people. His Shekinah dwelled in the temple in the wilderness. Now pay attention to this. Now, when the people finally entered into the promised land, a more permanent structure was being built. And this began in 960 BC or at the end of 960 BC, the, the more permanent structure because they left the wilderness. They finally made it to the promised land. And then there, Solomon, because David says, I want to build God a temple. God says, no, I'm going to have your son do it instead. You gather all the materials. He's going to build it. And so by 960 BC, around the year, a more permanent house was built for the Lord. Solomon built a temple in the city of Jerusalem, and God came to dwell among the people, his people, in the temple, uh, in the Jerusalem temple. There was no tent in the wilderness. Uh, that's what I just said. That's what I just said. That's what I just said. Did I not say that David wanted to build it, but he couldn't? Okay. Well, you can go back to the recording and go listen to it, because that's what I said. So, yeah, I already said that. Yeah. Anyways, so um, this was no tent in the wilderness. It was one of the most seven wonders of the ancient world. It was noted as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Okay. Now, look at what happened after the temple was built. You find this in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. It says there. Now, the Shekinah, this is what happens. Is that the Shekinah enters the temple in the days of Solomon. It says, and it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Okay, so did the Shekinah enter the temple that Solomon built? Yes, this is very important. Just like the tabernacle in the wilderness, God dwells with his people, and, in through, the, and through the sanctuary, he made a covenant with them because of the sanctuary. This is where he made a covenant with the people, is in the sanctuary. I will be your God, and you will be my people. And when they obeyed the Lord, that was his people. Do you understand? Did the people obey the Lord in this covenant? Hmm? No. No. In fact, what? They tried. they tried. They tried. Boy, they tried. They tried looking over the fences and looking at those girls in their short skirts of the pagan women. And yeah, they, they tried a lot of things. There was a lot of people that just drifted farther and farther. The more and more I read about the kings of Israel, it's just, you know, 90% of it is all, and the king did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the king did the evil in the sight of the Lord. It just was one wretched moment after another. So 800 years of rebellion was what the Israelite people were doing. Since the time of the wilderness, the people over and over and over again defiled the Lord in the sanctuary. Israel was a consistently, content, continually, an unfaithful bride to her husband, okay? And you find this in Second Chronicles 36, verses 14 through 16, where you see uh, how they chronicled these things. Israel was rebellious for a, a period of 800 years and an unfaithful bride. In fact, she was known as a harlot, okay? Now, this is very important. Even though God sent messengers day and night to them, the messengers were prophets such as Jeremiah were sent to them over and over again. It says there in Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 36, moreover, all the leaders of the priests and the people transgressed more and more. According to, this is a key word, all the abominations of the nation and defiled the house of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till when there was no remedy. There was nothing else that God can do. And this eventually led to the Babylonian captivity. 
in Ezekiel chapter 16 is a graphic description of the apostasy of Israel. It says there in Ezekiel 16, 15, but you trusted in your own beauty, played the harlot because of your fame, and poured out your harlotry on every passing by who would have it. This is important. Israel was unfaithful to her husband. And so God does what? He does a work of judgment. All right? So Israel, in 592 B.C., was beginning to be judged. And you can find the description of how God comes through his chair on his chariot from the north to judge Jerusalem for the abominations that are being committed to the, in the city. So Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 1, is taken in vision to see the works of God's judgment on Jerusalem. And here's what it says in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 4. Then I... Look, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north. Remember in the sanctuary, what's in the north? The table of showbread. Remember now, that table of showbread has wheels, okay? You know, we had discovered last time that the table of showbread is the throne of God. And it has two crowns representing two kings. So Jesus doesn't have his own throne. He sits at the throne with his father. Do you understand? So this in the north is G is God, Jesus, okay, and the Father, okay, coming out of the north. A great cloud with raging fire engulfed itself, and the brightness was all around it and radiated out of its midst like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. So now where is God going? He's coming out of the north. Where is he going? He's headed to the temple where in the temple he is going to judge Israel for their abominations. The abominations are shown to Ezekiel that had reached a climax in chapter 8. They had assimilated all the pagan practices to the point where they openly and desperately began worshiping the sun god that all the other nations around them were worshiping. Now this is important. And this worship would lead to the desolation of Israel. The abomination of desolations, two key words that you're going to see as we keep moving along here. So in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 16 and 17, this is some echoing. Uh, hold on. Um, let's see. Uh, hold on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now Ezekiel 8 verses 16 and 17 is the very highlight or the pinnacle of the abominations here that leads to Israel's desolation. It says, so he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house and there at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs towards the temple. So they weren't even facing the temple. They had their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east. And they were worshiping the sun towards the east. Okay, this was the very final straw for God. These abominations would lead to desolation. The word desolation means, do you know what that word desolation means? An end of ordered society. Now you take that as it is today. Is there an order to society today? Huh? There used to be an order to society today. But how, how is it going today? Is there an end of ordered society today? Can you tell? Do you think that this is a double, or a double prophecy that is going to repeat itself again? Let's go on. Let's see what this says. The reversal of the desolations would not be all, would not only be built by the physical city, but um, let me see that again. Um, the word desolation means the end of ordered society, both politically and religiously, as well as the destruction of the city. The reversal of the desolations would not only be to build a physical city, but to reestablish its political and religious institutions. This is very important. 
all right? Because people have a hard time with political right now. But if we would obey God, we would be what? A theocracy. Under God's law. The true law. Not oppressing women. Not making man the, the, the monarchy dictator headship. Not creating our own thoughts and our own feelings as opinion to what the vote will be. Do you understand? We would obey the Lord. The heavens above are under the theocracy of God. And you have to accept that. If you want to go to heaven, you want to obey the Lord. It is his kingdom. This is his planet. Is there order in society today? Why is that? Because we do not obey the Lord. Do you understand? So, because of all this, as we saw in chapter 1, in Ezekiel chapter 1, God coming out on his chariot out of the north, God comes in his fear, a fiery chariot to do a work of judgment on all of Israel. But not everyone was committing these abominations. This is why there had to be a work of judgment. Why? Why would there have to be... A, you can't just slam down a gavel and say guilty, all guilty and are punishable at death, right? No. This In this work of judgment, the Lord instructs the host of heaven to begin the process of charting those who were wicked and those who were righteous. It is noted when God does a work of judgment, he warns and he pleads with compassion. Then he gives people his final warning. He gives ample time for those abominations to be cast away from the people by their own choice and marks those who have chosen to heed the call and those who stayed with God. Those who chose to continue in the abominations, the Lord in his final act, unfortunately, Closes the door, separating the faithful from the unfaithful. All right? So in 596 BC, the righteous are separated from the wicked in the temple. And you find this in Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. It says, there, then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice. This is Ezekiel in vision. So he's looking ahead. He's being, he's being shown in vision what's going to happen. All right? Let those who have charge over the city draw near each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate. Remember, this is a vision with, with faces, which faces north, uh, each with a battle ax in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen and had an ink, writer, writer's ink horn at his side. Who do you think that is? That was Jesus. Yep. And one of the men among them was clothed with linen and had an ink horn in his side. They went in and stood beside the bronze altar that's in the court. Okay, so you're in the sanctuary. Now the glory of the Lord of Israel had gone up from the cherub, where it had been, to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen, who had the writer's ink horn on his side. And the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the forehead of the men, who sigh and cry over all the abominations. There's that key word again. A mark on the forehead. So does God put a mark on the forehead? Does he put it on the hand? You don't see that here, do you? He does not put it on the hand. But he puts a mark on the forehead. There's a reason for that. We'll get into that later. So put a mark on the forehead on the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations. So is he putting a mark over the people who are committing abominations? Huh? Who is he putting the mark on? Those who are signed. Go, what, Pete? His people, exactly. He's putting the mark over the people who are crying over these abominations and saying this is absolute up here and disgusting and we shouldn't be doing this. Right? And so he puts a mark on the forehead and signs to cry over the abominations that are done in it. This is 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 so there is a group of faithful people of the lord right and there needs to be a judgment of separation to be made because there is a group who will not be destroyed when the city is destroyed do you see this so now 
after there has been a separation of the faithful, we find in verse 5, it says, to the others he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens, and chill little children and women, and do not come near anyone who is, has the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Who's in the, who should be at the sanctuary? All the elders and the leaders, beginning with those who claim to be the most faithful and godly people in the world. Begin at my sanctuary. So they begin, there it is. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. All right, clearly, clearly here, the Shekinah came here to do a work of separation and a work of judgment before destruction came. Before the execution of the judgment is poured out, the Shekinah glory then, after he does this, departs from the temple. Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 9 says that this is what happens is when the judgment and the separation is finished, this, this is interesting, the Shekinah glory departs from the temple and lingers at the east gate of the temple. This is very interesting because there's something that there's a clue to this. There's, there's something connecting the dots here that you're going to see that begins the long hot summer about this. Ezekiel 10, 19 says, and the cherubim lifted their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight when they went out the wheels there's the wheels of the temple or i mean of the table of showbread the wheels they went out and the wheels were beside them and they stood at the door of the east gate of the lord's house and the glory of the of god of israel was above them is the glory of the lord still at the temple it is dwelling among the people, but then something happens, all right? Ezekiel eleven twenty two says this in 23. This is where the Shekinah then leaves the temple and the city and lingers for a period of time at the Mount of Olives and then leaves. It says there, so the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them and the glory of, of the God of Israel was high above them and the glory of the Lord went up in the midst of the city and stood on the mountain, which, on the, which is on the east side of the city. What mountain is on the east side of the city? It's the Mount of Olives. All right? The city and the temple are now desolate because the Lord's Shekinah glory left for good and because of the abominations. This is the abomination of desolation. So which mountain is on the east side of the city? Which side, which, which is it? You know what it is? It's the Mount of Olives. The glory of the Lord lingered for a moment of time and departed and went back to heaven. And the city was left marked to be destroyed and the city lay desolate because of the abominations. Isn't that interesting? Don't you, do you know how the story of Jesus went at the very last moments of his days. Let's, we'll get into that. We'll, we'll probably have to get into that in the next sermon. But in 592 BC, six years later, so it didn't automatically happen at that time. It actually, the destruction didn't happen for another six years. And the desolation of, of or the, the abominations committed created the desolation in 592 BC. In 2 Chronicles 36, 17 to 21, and you can read this, that the des desolation of Jerusalem comes when the temple and the city and the walls are destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, and then Jerusalem had ceased to function as a religious and political entity. All right? This is interesting because history will repeat itself again twice. Three times, actually. Twice, twice, twice. Therefore, he brought against the. Therefore, he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of the sanctuary. Isn't this the fulfillment of what we read in Ezekiel chapter nine? Who he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men in the sword with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young man or virgin. Or the age of the week, he gave them all into his hands. So Nebuchadnezzar fulfills Ezekiel chapter 9. 
Verse 18, and all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasure of the king and the, its leaders, all these he took back to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the walls of Jerusalem, burned it all in all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious possessions. And those who escaped from the sword, he carried away where they became servants to him and his sons. And that was the results of the abominations, which was total desolations, where the Shekinah glory, glory leaves the temple, left the city, lingered at the mountain, and I know he wept, and then left. Meaning that not only did God the Father leave, not only God the Son left, because that's the Shekinah glory, the Holy Spirit left. Now, remember, we were just discussing or coming to a conclusion that there is no organization in this society today, that this society is out of control. Do you realize that the Holy Spirit is being pulled away? We're repeating history. All right, but this was not the end of the theocracy for the Israelite people. God had mercy on them, and the prophecy ends with hope. Because now God puts these people in, in time out for 70 years. Okay, after 70 years, the Jewish nation would be given a second chance. So until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, see, verse 20 in 2 Chronicles 36, in verse 20, it gives us this hope that it says he will be, they will be put in time out or be carried away by Babylon. Why did they get carried away? Why did, why did Babylon carry them away? Because they got carried away with their Babylonian idols. So if you're going to get carried away with your idols, your idols are going to carry you away. Do you understand that? You get carried away with this stuff, they're going to carry you away. You're going to get your full treatment. Put away your Babylonian idols. You understand? So, but this isn't the end because there's some hope here. Because in verse 20, it says, until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath, as long as she lay desolate, she kept, <laughs> the land kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. It was so disgusting, so dis disruptive, so unruly there that even the land was crying out. And she finally got to rest for 70 years from all this oppression, this disgusting abominations that the, land, that the people were doing. And the Lord instructed Jeremiah, now this is beautiful. The Lord instructed Jeremiah, who was a contemporary of Daniel, who got carried away to Babylon, as a young child or as a very young teen. And Ezekiel was also a contemporary of Je Jeremiah. They all lived about the same time period, okay? Not all the same age, they just all lived in the same time period. They, they, they co-mingled or, or crossed each other at one point or another to write his, and so Jeremiah writes the Lord's love letter to Israel. Did you know that the Lord wrote a love letter to Israel had Jeremiah, while people were being carried captive, captive, and the palace was being raided, and all the servants were being rounded up, Jeremiah made sure to put these, this love, these love letters inside the backpacks of some of the servants. And then they got carried away to Babylon. And this, you know where the, those love letters are? It's Jeremiah chapter 29 to 31. Read those love letters. Those are the love letters that God sends to his bride. It says, you, you sit there, enjoy your time in Babylon, marry some, build your houses there, and I'll be back to get you. But you ain't coming back right now. You're in timeout. And I love you. Read Jeremiah 29 to 31. It's God's love letters. It's a beautiful letters too. We quote them all the time. We don't realize the, the, the history behind it or the, the nature behind it or what it's really talking about. It's beautiful for us personally, but when you understand why they're there. So stage two, wait, let me, let me back up. 
So God wasn't finished with Israel. After this captivity, God took them back to the land, to their land, and he gave them back, back another chance. However, this time he put the nation of Israel on probation. Okay? So stage two, this is the period of the 70-week prophecy. And you see this begin in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 22 to 23, where Israel is restored to their land after 70 years. The temple and the city walls are rebuilt, and their political and religious institutions begin to function again. They are now given a second chance. Now, I want you to understand something. The 70-year captivity is not the same as a 70-week prophecy. They're two separate things. People get this mixed up all the time because of all these numbers, all these things, 70 here, 70 there. 70. Just isolate the two from your brain and understand they're not the same thing. They were captive for 70 years, 70 physical, literal years. And now after that 70 physical, literal years, God gives them a, a prophet or gives them a time of probation. All right? And it's known as the 70 week prophecy in 536 BC. That's the end of the 70 years. It says this in second Chronicles chapter 36. Now in the first year of Cyrus, King of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. So who Jeremiah. Now you're going to find out that Daniel was reading this with reading Jeremiah's writings, the ones that were being fulfilled. Okay. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all the kingdom and also put in writing saying, thus says King Cyrus of Persia, all the kingdoms, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord has of heaven has given me. This is a pagan king saying that the Lord of heaven and earth has given me all these kingdoms. And he has, the Lord has commanded me, the king, to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Isn't that amazing? A pagan king is going to say something like this? Who among you is all of all his people? May the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. And that was a pagan king that proclaimed the word of the Lord. And so he was fulfilling prophecy because it happened right on time. So he started letting the people go, and the temple was finished in 515 BC. And this is the time during Haggai. Okay, and Haggai was examining the temple, and this is the post uh, exilic temple that did not have the glory of the temple that was built by Solomon. In fact, the Shekinah glory did not enter this temple that they were going to build. And when it was finished, this is what Haggai said in chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. Now, speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Zerodach, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, who is, a, is left among you who, who saw the temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is it not in your eyes as nothing? So he's looking at the temple. He's going, this is nothing like Solomon's temple. It wasn't even a shadow of what the temple that Solomon built was. The Shekinah did not enter this temple. And as it did in, so but as it did in Solomon's time, it was just an ordinary temple. You can almost say just an ordinary building. But the Lord still had compassion on his chosen people. Now, this is important, but what Haggai foretells the Jews, the world has not been able to, now what, what Haggai says here next, the Jews even today cannot explain this because the Shekinah glory never entered this temple, all right, that they're, that they're building. It was built in 515 BC. And to, to this day, they cannot explain this prophecy right here. Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. And it's, it's a prophecy, prophecy that predicted that this latter temple would far surpass the glory of the temple that was built by Solomon, even though the Shekinah glory did not enter it as it did in the wilderness or that it did in, in the temple of Solomon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations. He's talking about this temple. And they shall come to what? The desire of all nations. Ah, 
It can also be translated desire of ages. Huh. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. This is the very same temple that was destroyed in 70 AD. And the Jews to this day can't explain that. You know why they can't explain it? Because they reject the Messiah. What Shekinah glory was going to fill this temple? <laughs> Jesus Christ himself. Haggai predicts it. When you read this, the desire of nations or of all ages, these should be the most comforting words that a Christian could ever hear. What is it that the nations all desire? What do they desire? Peace, comfort, kindness, goodness, meekness, love, especially love. All the things that they all desire are in that man, Christ Jesus. And it has never been built again. This temple, in, 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 it was destroyed in 70 AD. It was never built again. And the Jews today are still trying to explain this because they rejected Jesus Christ. And there is no explanation for this prophecy because what filled that temple? Nothing. If you don't have Jesus Christ, nothing filled that temple. From the Jews, they have to say that they refuse to admit this. This is the pointing to Jesus, the Messiah, that had already came and already filled the temple with his glory. This temple had more glory than the temple of Solomon or in the wilderness itself. So the Jews still cannot explain how this former temple was going to have glory, more glory than the temple of Solomon, which they always talk about. Verse 8 says, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, and says the Lord of hosts, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. They cannot explain this. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. If it's, if it's not because of Jesus Christ, and if they cannot explain this, why is the temple destroyed? Why is it not rebuilt? Because Jesus is the temple. He is the sanctuary. And the Jews are still, even to this day, trying to understand this prophecy because the temple was never physically as glorious as the temple of Solomon. It never was. God put Israel on probation at this time. Remember that what was written, the, the written by the prophet Jeremiah? What we read in Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 36, all those events that, did, that were chronicled by Jeremiah. This sequence of events is found in the book of Daniel, chapter 9. It says there in chapter 9, verse 2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, stood by the book, stood by the books, the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord. There it is, through the Jeremiah of the prophet. So Dar Daniel is, is reading the book of Jeremiah and studying about when this captivity is going to finally be released, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. In other words, okay, I'm going to put, get you out of time out. You're going to come out of time out. But, so Daniel goes back and reads a scroll that, Daniel, that, that Jeremiah had placed inside the backpacks of some captives being sent from the palace of Jerusalem, uh, from Babylon, uh, or being sent to Babylon 69 years before this. So this was in 605 BC. Jeremiah 29 says, now he wrote these letters before that, but he placed them in there in the year 605 BC because it says now these are the words of the letter of the of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainders of the elders who were carried away captive. This is Jeremiah chapter 29. Okay? So these are the love letters that God sends to the captives. All right? So now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainders of the elders who were carried away captive. So he tells those servants, you go give these to the elders, to the priests, to the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. Verse 2, this happened after Jeconiah, 
Jeconei, the king, the queen mother, the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths had all departed from Jerusalem. Why? Because they were carried away. They all got taken away. This, the letter was sent. This is verse three. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisha, the son of Shaphan, Jeremiah, another Jeremiah, a totally different name, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judas, was sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, who all were carried away captive, of whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. And then the love letters begin. Go read Jeremiah 29 in this mind now. Now you understand that the Lord sends them love letters and says, don't you worry. You're in time out. Live your lives. Grow your food. Marry some of them. Live among them. Be my example. And I'm going to come and get you in 70 years. And it goes all the way until chapter 31. All right. So. As Daniel was recollecting these words, Babylon had fallen some 10 years earlier than this. They were now captives of the Persian kings of the empire. So it's almost over. This is like year 69. And he realizes, I've been in captivity for 69 years now. As he reads the words, it struck him. Wait, that means the Lord promised 70 years. That means we're going home. So you see why he's re recollecting back to Jeremiah's scrolls. He's reading. He's like, how long is this going to go on, Lord? And then he goes back and is reassured with these love letters that Jeremiah left behind. And, oh, we're going home. But something troubled him because 11 years earlier, the word still haunted him in his mind. And those words came from Daniel chapter 8. Because when he was in vision 11 years earlier, he was with Gabriel, and Gabriel was standing with two others, and these two others asked, how long is this going to be? And it said, until 2,300 days, then the sanctuary would be cleansed. Daniel did not understand these words entirely. He took them as referring to his captivity, the temple to be rebuilt again. And he knew, Daniel understood that the 23 days actually meant years. This caused him to panic, thinking there is something that he must more do because it's not 70 years, it's 2,300 years before we're getting out of here. This caused him to panic, thinking there's something more he must do. So he prayed and he prayed. And it's one of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible. And you find this in Daniel chapter 9. This is then the rest of the story that happens, and it begins in 535 BC, because in 536 BC, the Persian Empire decides to let the people go and start building their temple and the city of Jerusalem again. It says there in verse 20 of Daniel 9, now I was while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sins and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my supplications before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the vision at the beginning, that's Daniel chapter 8, because Daniel 9 is just a continuation of Daniel 8. Daniel 8 is an open-end story. It never ended. That's because he fainted. He couldn't handle what he was reading or what he was listening to, I mean. So he passed out. This is 11 years later. Gabriel comes back. <laughs> he had some vision. He's like, okay, hold on. He came, caused fly swiftly, reached out to me at the time in my evening while he was praying and he informed me and talked with me saying, oh, Daniel, I have now come. I have now come for it to give you skill to understand because he, he knows that Daniel's freaking out. And he needs to let the people know to be prepared. And at the beginning of your supplications, the command went out. And I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Wouldn't you want to hear that from an angel? Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Gabriel flies quickly over to Daniel to tell him before they release from captivity, Israel has a second chance, but they are going to be put on probation. And that's why Gabriel comes. He says, I'm going to, the Lord said to tell me to tell you, you're going to be let go. Don't worry. 70 years is almost up. You're wrapping it up. You're going home. But 70 weeks now, it starts in verse 24, are determined for your people. All right. 
So erase the thought of being forever in captivity, Daniel. You're not going to be there for 2,300 years. All right. But 70 weeks, you're put on probation for your people and for your holy city. And this is why for 70 weeks, this is what's going to happen for your people. Something is going to come. Somebody is going to come to finish the transgressions, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, right? To seal up the vision and prophecy. Hmm. And to anoint the most holy. During the 70 weeks, this was, filled, was fulfilled by Jesus in 31 AD. All right? Now, if Jesus fulfilled all these, what compels my brain and makes me just so astonished is how in the world futurists take this prophecy and put the last week into the future and say that this is all, uh, yeah, it all was done by Jesus, but the last week is the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is going to be cut off and it's going to cause all these problems. It's like God does not need to cut off his prophecy. It's a full 70 weeks. How can it be a 70 week prophecy if you're spreading it all out through history? And we don't even, it's not even started yet. The last week makes no sense whatsoever, but they're doing it. And you know, it's 90% of the, of the population of Christians believe this. Know therefore and understand that going forth from the command. Now this is the command to restore and build Jerusalem. When was that? That was when they were going to be released. All right. The which and right in 457 BC, the temple was rebuilt in 515 BC, finished completely in 520 or yeah, in 515 BC. But the city of Jerusalem, the entire city in the walls, was completely or was beginning by the command of, of Artaxerxes in the time of Ezra in 457 BC, when the city and the restoring of the temple was all going to be built and complete. Okay, and then that began in 457 BC. And so it says, no, they don't understand that going forth from the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and then 62 weeks. Well, 77 plus 62 equals 69 weeks. All right. So now there's no way that any of these prophecies work unless you use a day year principle. And I have a study called the 20 reasons for the day year principle that we will get into later. But this is how you unpack it is how many days in one week? Seven days. How many days then in 69 weeks? Well, seven times 69 equals 483 days. So now you have the days, now just converted into two prophetic years. And the answer is, so now the seven, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks is actually 483 years. So from the point of rebuilding and restoring Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there'll be 483 years until the Messiah is anointed. And then after the, so add, add the 457 BC, the 483 years. And what do you come up to? So you just go negative 457 plus 483, and you come up with the, the number 27. Actually, you come up with 26, but you have to remember there's no year zero. So you have to add one, so it's 27. Oh, that means it's 27 AD. Now, Luke revealed that Jesus was born in the fall between the end of September and the beginning of October somewhere. We know it's at 3 BC because, now this would take too long to break it all down. If you go to Luke chapter three, verse one, for three months, there is a, a governor and kings and patriarchs that are all in the same place in the same position. And there was only time, one time in history that happened and they recorded it. And that was in 3 BC, during the fall of 3 BC. That's when Jesus was born. And Luke does an amazing account, historical account, even going back to the Chronicles to, re, to recount how, uh, how we know that the time that Jesus was born in, was in the fall in 3 BC. So the time periods are messed up. They can't change them because they had already kept this going in motion for hundreds of years. So they couldn't change it. So they just had to leave it. So Jesus was born before he was born. 
He was born in 3 BC. Not on year one or year zero, like people say. When was the Messiah anointed? He was anointed at, at, when he was 30 years old. That's why the 27 is so odd, because you have to subtract three. So in Luke chapter 3, 23, we know that Jesus was baptized when he was uh, began to be a rabbi teacher, and they're only allowed to do that when you're 30 years old in the rabbinical rules. You cannot be a teacher unless you're 30 years old, and you have to be baptized. So it says in verse 23 of Luke 3, now Jesus himself began his ministry about 30 years of age, being as it was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli. You see? Now, how do we know that he was the Messiah? In Mark chapter, or Matthew 16, it says there in verse 15, he said to him, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered to him. Now, this is important. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. You are the Christ. What does it mean to be the Christ? The Greek word is anointed. Christos. Anointed one. So Jesus was anointed. And verse 16 and 17 of Matthew 3, it reveals us when he was baptized. That means anointed. Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened up to him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is the moment that Jesus was anointed. Did Daniel say to anoint the most holy? Yes. This is part of that prophecy of seven weeks and 62 weeks. In 27 AD, Jesus started his ministry. Anointed. All right? This is the fall of 27 AD. So Daniel 9 continues. The street shall be built again and the walls even in trouble sometimes. When was that? It was during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. So the walls would be built again. Did they get built again? Yes. Even in troublesome times. Now, futurists take this and say that this is, this is work. They're working on this right now, that they're fulfilling this prophecy. Do you see how they break this all up? It is an absolute disaster. Verse 26 says, and after the 62 weeks, that can't even, even fall into time. And now so you're, you have to literally throw away the 70 weeks and just come up with your own your, your own prophecy by now, because you, you can't even fall along with seven weeks and 62 weeks. It makes no sense. And they literalize it. They literally make this literal, like it's literally 62 and seven weeks. It makes no sense. And the funny thing is, is Timothy LaHaye, who is one of the writers, co-writers for Left Behind series, writes in his introduction that it's a novel that it's a novel, that this is not even real, and people are taking this as real. And he makes movies about it with Kirk Cameron and all these other people, and they all get excited, and they're taking this as bona fide facts. And they don't read their Bibles. After the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. What do you mean, cut off? You know, in Leviticus, being cut off from the camp meant you were cut off from the life giver. Jesus was crucified. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The, the people of the prince. You know who that is? That's Rome. That comes and destroys the city and the sanctuary. And this is because of the abominations. And it, it says, it shall, it, it, the end of it shall be with a flood. That is an army that will surround and besiege and destroy them. And how do you know? Well, what is a flood in Bible prophecy and symbology? Isaiah 17 says, woe to the multitudes of many people who make a noise like a roars of the sea and the rushing of the nations that they make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters, roar of a flood. The nations will rush like rushing many waters. You see that? And this is a fulfillment that will come into play in 70 AD. And until the end of the war, the de desolations are determined. That is that the judgment will determine what is it going to be? Are you going to have, are you going to prepare the way for your Messiah? Or are you going to have him crucified? 
Once the desolations are determined, then he shall confirm a covenant for, with them for one week. Jesus comes and confirms what covenant for one week? To finish the transgressions, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, righteousness and to seal up this vision and prophecy. To seal it up. And how is it going to seal up? Are you going to accept your Messiah or are you going to reject him? If you accept him, we can we go we can go home. If you reject him, your city will be destroyed and your people. So what happened? But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offerings. How can you put this as the Antichrist? I just don't see how you can make this the Antichrist. Who put an end to our sacrifices and offerings in the middle of the week? How much is a middle of a week? It's three and a half days. Convert that into years. Did Jesus not do his ministry for three and a half years? And then he what? He ended his sacrifice and offerings, didn't he? That's the end of the spring feast. You see that? See how this goes right back to the Hebrew calendar? So, in the wing of abominations, there's that word again, shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Didn't Jesus say in Matthew 24, what our scripture reading was, know therefore and understand, Daniel, the abomination of desolations. You see why we're reading this? To understand what this means. Because this is a two-fold prophecy. All right? Now, this is the second stage of Israel's existence, right? As a nation, as God's people. This last part fulfills, fulfills which is determined abominations. This fulfills... This fulfillment is the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, the close of the nation of Israel's probation. Because on the wing of abominations, one shall make it desolate. Why? Because you rejected your Messiah. That means the city will be destroyed. If you wouldn't have rejected your Messiah, but he's already prophesying what they're going to do. And the funny thing is, is, is Jesus needed to do this in order to fulfill prophecy to save the world, right? It's just fascinating how God works. How can a man write this out of his own mind? It's impossible. Now, here's the funny thing. The Jewish rabbis from the New Testament times onward to this day are, are and were always perplexed about Daniel chapter 9, 24 to 27. When the newly arriving rabbis would be taught the Old Testament, which is the only portion of scriptures they believe in, the new rabbis would read this prophecy, discovering for themselves that the Messiah was foretold in the Old Testament. They would start realizing that this prophecy is literally pointing to Jesus Christ undeniably as a Messiah who had already came. This was an abomination to the leaders of the, of the Jewish faith. The Jews finally enacted a law into the Talmud forbidding the reading of even one single word of Daniel 9. Did you know that? Here it is. Here is the words coming straight from the Talmudic law, page 978, section 2, line 28. This is in the Talmud. Let the bones of the hands and the bones of the fingers decay and decompose of him who turns the pages of the book of Daniel 9, 24, 27, and may his memory rot off the face of the earth forever. That's their own book. That's their own Old Testament. Is there not confusion in the land? Why would they want to keep this quiet? Wow. Instead of accepting the truth that the Messiah had already come. They'd rather put in a curse to anybody who reads and understands, just like Jesus said, therefore let them who read and understand the book of Daniel, understand the abomination of desolations. They put a curse on So now that the rabbis are all terrified to read the book of Daniel, you'll be cut off. You will be cut out from the Jewish rabbi rabbinical system if you do. Unbelievable. And the evangelical world has taken a page of the Jewish rabbis and followed the writings of the Jesuits unaware, who created the false doctrine of futurism and helping along with the Jewish Talmud, placing the last week of this prophecy into unknown future without examining the roots to where this false prophecy actually originated from. Because nobody knows why they're following futurism. Because if they would, you know what would happen? And I'm going to have a whole sermon on this. They would all realize they'd have to be Seventh-day Adventists. Straight up. 
bottom line, because when they'd start connecting the dots, they would realize that they're following the sun on a Sunday. And somebody put that inside Christian movements. And that would mean that they'd have to break away from this and logically listen to what the Roman Catholic Church said in the first place. If you're going to follow the Bible, the most logical thing to do, if you're going to worship on, on the true day, the biblical day, which is the seventh day, you might as well logically become a seventh-day Adventist. Are they not taking pages from the devil? Now, there is still three and a half years left in the middle of the week. We got to Jesus. So what happened at the last half? Well, that's for a future sermon because it ends in 34 AD. Something happened in 34 AD. That would be the determining of the desolation there for the very last time. It would be determining what? The factor that the door of probation closes for the Jewish people, the chosen people. Now, during the period of the 70 weeks, which started in 457 BC, ended in 34 AD, God sent many additional messengers to Israel. Men like Haggai, Zechariah, Joshua, Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Malachi, and finally John the Baptist. Yet, when Jesus came, the leaders of the Jewish nation were obviously oblivious to his mission, and they did not really understand why they existed, so they rejected their Messiah. And this is going to happen again. So this is stage two of the three stages of Israel in the final last gap. When we come back, we'll, we'll get back to the, the last one, the third one, when Jesus comes. And the last part of the 70-week prophecy, and what happens that kicks off, actually is the debut for the long, hot summer. And why the dragon was enraged with the woman in her seat. We'll get into this. It's amazing how this all falls into play. And the reason why we're doing this is because you need to understand why you're an Adventist. You need to understand why God has put all these things in the Bible and the purpose is in your mind and your heart that you want to follow what the Lord says, not what the leaders in the world say. It's going to come to a point where you're going to be so compelled. Ellen White says the only way that you're going to be able to get through this is that if you only follow the Bible and the Bible itself, not even your own feelings, you will be able to trust. It's coming. The disorderly disorder conduct, the morals, the values have all been tossed aside. Everybody is starting to reject God just like they did here. Things are going to happen again. We need to be prepared. So I don't know about you, but I know about me. I want to go home. I want to go to heaven. I want to see the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way I'm going to do that is to follow his word and not trust in kings and princes and not trust what the world is saying or what is unfolding or chasing after events and looking at the world to see what's happening and try to replace that somewhere, apply that inside the Bible to see what my feelings are inside the Bible so then I can confirm that I'm going in the right direction instead of following the word for what it says and disregarding what the world says or what the world is doing. Observing it, keeping an eye on where everybody's standing, standing on the wall is one thing, but to be chasing around the events and trying to apply them in biblical prophecy so you can try to confirm to everybody that your, your opinions are actually prophetic and things that are happening, making and stretching scripture out of, out of its, it, making it so distorted that it makes absolutely no sense, but everyone is so terrified because of the words that they'll believe anything. We have to trust what the word says before anything else. First begin with the word. So if it's like you, as it is with me, I'm going to ask that we take this to the Lord in prayer and ask him to please guide us in these days, these moments, the very last moments on this earth. Lord, Heavenly Father, I, I pray, Lord, that you guide us and direct us, lead us. Things are going to become so deceptive. You said there, 
uh, your servant Matthew wrote your words as the disciples came to you saying, what will be the end of these things? What will it be like in the end times? The very first thing you said, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, for false Christs and false prophets will arise. And Lord, I just pray that you teach us the difference between the true and the false. Help us be studied in your word, to be guided by your word and your principles, to stand with thus saith the Lord and nothing else, Lord, not our facts, not our opinions, not our feelings, but your word. And Lord, I just pray that you guide us in this way. Teach us that when you come and fly over, that you put a mark on our head, on our forehead, that we will stand in the day when you come and take us home. Bless each one of us here. Bless each one who's listening. Lord, save us when you come. And I say this all in your precious son's name, the name above all names, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes. Linda? What's that? Are you still having studies up at Linda's? Yes, sir. What time? At four. Okay.